Hi, my name is John Guess, and I'm the CEO of the Houston Museum of African American Culture. And we're delighted to have you here today for this really engrossing conversation that we're going to have on pluralistic representation in museums. Museums, as you know, create and maintain uh, cultural identities and stereotypes. And that whole area has been the subject of intense discussion uh, over the last couple of years, uh, especially now. And so this museum uh, is pleased to bring two really top-notch uh, experts uh, to talk about uh, pluralistic uh, representation. Uh, let me just say that this is in line with uh, the museum's um, installation, Kuba Saleh, uh, 3020 CE, which we have for the first time out of Canada from the Aga Khan Museum uh, in Toronto. Uh, without further ado, let me talk, uh, let me introduce our speakers for today. Um, Michael Shagnon is a museum curator specializing in painting and the arts of the book from early modern Persian ed sphere. He has served as curator at the Aga Khan Museum in Toronto since May of 2019. Dr. Shagnon has previously held posts at the Brooklyn Museum, LACMA, and Japan Society. And his teaching experience includes a graduate seminar on Persian painting at Columbia University in New York. 2019 seemed to be a, a momentous time uh, for, uh, for experts uh, for this, uh, this presentation because in 2019, uh, Stephen Machesio also came to the Blaffer Gallery uh, from the Cincinnati uh, Center for Contemporary Arts. Uh, while in Cincinnati, uh, Stephen um, curated Bildering, Misbehaving the City traveled to the Blaffer. Uh, previously, he served as the curator at the Southeastern Center for Contemporary Art in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and as director of the 2012 Festival in Poland. He has also participated in curatorial residences in Korea, Germany, Canada, and the United States. Stephen earned his Master of Arts degree from the Center for Curatorial Studies at Bard College. So with no further ado, I give you Stephen and Michael. Thank you so much, John. Um, I wanted to thank everyone who's joined us here today. Uh, my name is Michael Chagnon. I'm curator at the Aga Khan Museum. And first off, I want to thank John Guest from the Houston Museum of African American Culture, which has been an incredible partner for us in bringing uh, this wonderful artwork, Kumbi Saleh 3020 CE, to Houston, uh, an opportunity for which we're incredibly grateful, and John has been an in incredible partner to work with on this project. Um, I also want to thank my interlocutor today, Stephen Mataicho, from uh, the Blacker Art uh, Museum. Uh, I would love to uh, also thank Heinz College of Architecture, where we are today, for opening up this beautiful space to us um, at University of Houston. And uh, also very uh, great thanks to the Aga Khan Council uh, for the Southwest, and particularly to Sultana Mangalji, uh, without whom uh, this project would not have uh, gotten off the ground and we would not be here in, in Houston. So um, really my sincerest thanks to all of you. Um, uh, the Aga Khan Museum, for those who aren't aware, is North America's only museum dedicated to the uh, arts and cultures of Islamic civilizations. Uh, opened in 2014 um, in Toronto, uh, Ontario. Uh, today I'm going to talk about a relatively recent acquisition um, at the Aga Khan Museum. Uh, this is Kumbi Saleh 3020 CE by the artist Echo Nimako, about which I'll speak in a moment. Um, but I wanted to specifically focus on Kumbi Saleh, uh, which you see behind me. Uh, I wanted to uh, speak about Kumbi Saleh uh, in relation to uh, pluralism and cultural representation in museums. And the work, for lack of a better word, the work that uh, artwork like Kumbi Saleh performs in uh, having us rethink cultural representation in museums. 
Um, so I'll start with a few brief comments about the artwork as a point of departure for thinking about these uh, bigger topics. Uh, and then uh, Stephen has agreed to uh, have a, a little bit of a conversation with me and then he uh, will also speak about um, similar topics at the Blackburn. So, uh, Kumbi Saleh, 3020 CE, is one of 10 sculptures that was produced by the Toronto-based Ghanaian-Canadian artist Eko Nimako. Uh, he produced these works in response to the Aga Khan Museum's Fall 2019 exhibition, Caravans of Gold, Fragments and Time, which was generated by the Block Museum at Northwestern University. Um, the series that Echo created uh, was titled Building Black Civilizations, and Kumbi Saleh 3020 CE was the centerpiece. As you can see here, uh, it's a work of art that's constructed entirely of black Lego bricks. Uh, Echo works in the signature medium. His signature medium is black Lego, and uh, the piece, uh, the sculpture, is constructed, in fact, of over 100,000 black Lego bricks. Um, so uh, Kumbi Saleh 3020 was the centerpiece of this series that we showed uh, in fall of 2019. Uh, and the, the sculpture reimagines the West African metropolis from the medieval period known as Kumbi Saleh, projecting it 1,000 years into the future. A bit of historical background to help situate the sculpture. Kumbi Saleh is the name of a place in southern Mauritania, believed to have been the capital of the medieval Ghana Empire, which flourished uh, between the 8th and, I'm sorry, between the 9th and the 13th centuries. Uh, the Ghana Empire was among the wealthiest and most powerful kingdoms of medieval West Africa, flourishing on the rim of the Trans-Saharan trade routes in a region that spans present-day Mauritania, Mali, and Senegal. Medieval Arab geographers described the capital as a vibrant trading hub, physically and demographically split between a wealthy Muslim mercantile class and an indigenous ruling elite. You can see here a quote by the uh, geographer Al-Bakri, which describes the city as having these two separate zones uh, where uh, the, the ruler had his uh, enclave and then separated at a bit of a distance, the Muslim population had a bit of their own space. 17th, now just to note that these early Arabic geographies, Arabic language geographies, uh, Al Bakri was writing in the 11th century, uh, do not mention the name of the city. They call it the city of Ghana, which is referring to the empire, it seems. Medieval, I'm um, sorry, 17th century West African historians identified the city's name as Kumbi when they were discussing this empire. And so this led 20th century French archeologists and historians to link that Kumbi mentioned in the sources with a site in Southern Mauritania called Kumbi Saleh. They thought that the two were the same. Now, the association uh, cannot be definitively established, however, because the 20th century archeology span does not 100% match the descriptions in the earlier writings. And so there's a sort of disconnect between the histories, the written history, and the archaeological record. Whether Kumbi and Kumbi Saleh are one and the same is still a matter of uh, a speculation debate. But this ambiguity nonetheless provides an opening for the artist Echo Nimako to reimagine not only this place in the past, but to project it into a future that is glorious. Now, uh, what is the significance of this sculpture to the Aga Khan Museum? Uh, again, a little bit of history, a little background. Until the 1980s or 90s, the academic study of Islamic art history uh, and the museum institutions that often reflect and support academic narratives tended to focus on the material culture of the Middle East. So Islamic collections were really primarily focused on arts of the Middle East, North Africa, uh, and Central Asia, while overlooking, at the same time, not only the significance, but the very presence of Islam in other geographies, including Sub-Saharan, East, and West Africa. Um, that basically means, on the African continent, all regions that fall outside the Arabic-speaking North. Uh, would have been overlooked. 
And this, despite the fact, as we can see on this map here, the robust presence of Muslim communities from the 8th century onward, and the fact that today Sub-Saharan Africa is home to over 150, Muslim, 150 million Muslims. Although academic scholarship has recently begun to correct course, uh, most museums uh, with significant Islamic collections continue to perpetuate entrenched narratives that limit the parameters of what constitutes Islamic, and by default in thinking about African art, what constitutes African art. Most museums have yet to create physical or mental spaces that represent the lived realities of cultural experience, past and present, particularly when such experiences fall between the cracks of rigidly defined taxonomies. That's a fancy way of saying, in other words, museums often tell us this is African or Islamic art, rather than explore what it means to be African and Islamic art. A side note is uh, that I want to just say is that I use the term African art really broadly as broad as the term Islamic art is, but of course these are incredibly heterogeneous categories and uh, when we think about just the categories themselves, they're automatically problematic, but internally they're already um, incredibly heterogeneous, so it's even hard to say African art just on its own, for example. I wanted just to call attention to the fact that there are places uh, in the past, there are museums in the past that did uh, begin to explore these, um, these sorts of questions of uh, Islam in Africa, including in 1985 at the Brooklyn Museum where uh, an exhibition, a curator's choice exhibition built on the permanent collection focused specifically on uh, Islamic cultural expressions in Africa, looking at Egypt, but also Sub-Saharan Africa and North Africa. And here's just a slide of an installation shot from 1985. Uh, at the Aga Khan Museum, where the permanent collection has a similar contour as other museums uh, in terms of the shape of its Islamic collection, its permanent collection, the acquisition of Kumbi Saleh 3020 CE in 2019 was a major step forward uh, in readdressing how we represent the inherent pluralism of Islamic societies and civilizations particularly in relation to Africa. With its one foot in the medieval past, Echo Nimako's sculpture offers audiences in Toronto and now in Houston at the Houston Museum of African American Culture and who knows where next, a window onto exceedingly important moments, uh, this exceedingly important moment of medieval pluralism in a geography that had for too long gone unrepresented in museum collections of Islamic art. Kumbi Saleh, of course, also has its other foot in the future. The story it tells um, is not the Kumbi Saleh of 1,000 years ago, but of a Kumbi Saleh that exists 1,000 years from now. Both utopian and speculative, that Kumbi Saleh, like other Afrofuturist works, and I'm here showing some stills from the 2017 movie Black Panther, uh, that Kumbi Saleh and other Afrofuturist works of art reclaim the historical narrative, disrupting entrenched academic modes of narrating history that are often perpetuated in museums. I'll quote the artist Echo Nemako himself as he's written about this, um, paraphrasing a bit here. He says, as an Afrofuturist work of art, Kumbi Saleh 3020 CE celebrates and reimagines a blackness that is not constructed against the backdrop of enslavement, colonization, and violence. Rather, the work reappropriates blackness from the psyches of Western narratives and centers it in a realm of black imagination and black consciousness. The implications of this strategy can be profoundly felt in museum settings. In disrupting the linear and purportedly objective narrative of history laid out in most museums, Kumbi Saleh 3020 CE and other Afrofuturist artworks open up paths for new voices to be heard in historical collections. And it is precisely by fostering multivocality through art and its display that we at the Aga Khan Museum hope to fulfill the pluralistic purview of our mission. So uh, that's just one final shot here of the, the beautiful and glorious Kumbi Saleh 3020. Um, but I'd like to invite Stephen uh, back up, and I will fast forward to 
Maybe Michael, before that, I'd like to ask you a few questions. About Absolutely. That. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, Michael, the, fir the first thing I'd like to know is, um, you know, you, you first presented this work as part of um, the Building Black Civilizations in 2019. And then the work was acquired by the Aga Khan Museum in 2021. And we know that's a relatively short time period, and yet a great deal happened in that span of time, particularly, you know, the, the murder of George Floyd, the sort of, the rough, Black Lives Matter was already happening, but it sort of reached a new level, a new level of expanse. And so I'm wondering if, if you can speak about sort of the genesis of the show, about its impact at your museum, and the decision making in regards to the presentation and the acquisition and, and how the nature of that presentation shifted, you know, in, in that short amount of time. Uh, the, uh, the, the series, Echo's series, so Echo is a, a local artist in Toronto. Um, we, we were very keen to, as we were taking the, the, um, the, the Caravans of Gold exhibition from the Block Museum, uh, which we've been in discussions with them uh, for some time to bring that show. We wanted to present a contemporary reaction, mm -hmm. essentially, to um, this show that was about medieval West African and uh, Saharan artwork, and primarily an archaeological show. Um, and we thought quite a bit about it, but uh, found Echo, who was working right in Toronto, uh, working in actual fragments. Legos, after all, are fragments. And so we thought that this would have been a brilliant sort of conversation to bring this historical and archeological material from medieval Africa into uh, the present day. It just so happens that um, the day before we contacted Echo, or the week before we contacted Echo, he actually drove by the museum, uh, which is located uh, in the northern part of Toronto, in this beautiful building. He drove by and he thought to himself, he actually told us this, he thought to himself, I want to show my art at this museum someday. So there was a bit of kismet involved <laughs> with, with the project. Um, I, I also want to acknowledge that, the, that Echo was sort of brought to our attention, the, the, to the curator's attention, by a member of our exhibition staff um, named uh, Simon Barron, who knew of, of Echo's work and said, hey guys, I think you really want to show this guy. So it was a really incredible um, team effort to identify the artist and to bring him in. Um, when the, the series um, Building Black Civilizations um, opened in conjunction with Caravans of Gold, immediately we, we saw this work and thought how extraordinary it was. And that we have this opportunity to really address representations of blackness in museums, not just of Africa, but of, of, of black culture in museums in a way that we've never done before, and in a way that was actually centrally relevant to what we do at the museum. I don't think that the thinking was ever untethered from the moment that we find ourselves in um, after Black Lives Matter and everything that has happened, at least you know, in North America. And so uh, that was always central to our thinking, in fact. Now when, I'll say that we had nine of the sculptures which were small on view at the museum when caravans opened. It was only, and that opened in September, it was in November that Kumbi Saleh actually came to the museum and we put it this enormous uh, sculpture in the center of our permanent collection gallery. It was only when that was finally made and shown that the idea percolated in my head that this is something that we might want to um, bring into the collection permanently. Um, and my rationale for that was that um, I've, I've always been of the position that museums need to be hubs that support local artists and local arts. And so it was very much about a Toronto-based ingenious work that was made in response to something that we were doing at the museum. It's very much part of our institutional history, um, and it was also a way for us to support a local uh, artist and to show that we are, uh, as an institution, at the forefront of supporting the arts in Toronto. So that was, there were many different factors that went into um, the idea, but it was, it was a piece that so centrally speaks to our mission that we it would have been a missed opportunity not to bring it into the collection. And full disclosure, I'm from Toronto originally, wow. so I'm especially biased and taking great pride in this. Uh, <laughs> Very good. Um, 
But I did, but I'm glad that you mentioned the mission of the Aga Khan Museum because I, I'd like to talk a little bit more about that. Um, it celebrates Islamic art, Persian art, and Muslim culture. And correct me if I'm wrong, it was originally intended to be located in the UK, um, but there was some level of protest around the location, and so it moved locations and ultimately landed in Canada, which is a wonderful sort of set of circumstances. But I'm wondering if you can tell me a little bit more about how the Aga Khan sort of lives its mandate sort of locally, nationally, and internationally. Well, we're like like Houston, we are an incredibly diverse city. I know Houston is the most diverse city in, in uh, the US, uh, probably so, and I think uh, we can say the same in Toronto. It is uh, the most diverse city in Canada. Um, I think that the idea of having a museum that uses an art collection to speak to the contemporary relevance of uh, pluralism, of the, the ways that we express culture, that we represent culture um, in, uh, in bringing in multiple voices. Uh, there couldn't be a better uh, location for it than in Toronto. So it's, uh, again, um, a, perfectly, a perfectly matched sort of situation. We, we live our mission by not presenting art through this art historical lens. We don't strive for that. Our collection is there to start a conversation about pluralism and to think about the contributions of Muslim civilizations to world heritage. Um, it's the starting point of a conversation. Now you get to also look at some of the greatest examples of Islamic art that are known in, in museum collections. It's an incredible collection of about 1,500 objects uh, that are at the very, very top of quality of historical importance and so on. Um, but really, that's just the beginning point. Um, it's a way to bring people in to talk about um, the issues that are most meaningful to us today if we see what's going on in the world. These conversations about how cultures uh, speak to one another, how communities work with one another, there couldn't be any more important work than uh, having a space dedicated to that mm -hmm. and to leaving spaces for all different voices. Right, absolutely. Well, maybe that's a great transition because I would like to speak a little bit about a show that we presented at the Blacker that's very much about this sort of model of cultural pluralism, cultural hybridity, and then also bring John into the, to the quite, uh, conversation. Right after, just speak a little bit about this exhibition, Jamal Cyrus. Great, thank you. So just in, in very brief, uh, this was a show that we presented last summer, and it's currently on display at the ICALA. Um, but the artist's name is Jamal Cyrus. The exhibition is called The End of My Beginning, and it was a mid-career survey of his work. And while Jamal's work is very significantly invested in the local, I wanted to really emphasize the, the relevance and the importance of passage and travel um, within, his within his artwork. Um, and so we're just we're looking at an installation photo here, um, sort of of the main gallery as you walk in. And what I want to highlight, um, Jamal talks about surveying the Afro-Atlantic, as in his words, an intercontinental and multinational geography describing the circulation of ideas between Africa, Europe, and the Americas. And he's very influenced by um, the thesis of British historian, theorist, and academic Paul Gilroy, um, who in 1993 wrote the, the Black Atlantic, Modernity and Double Consciousness, where he traces the gestational period underpinning the birth of black cultures in the New World, where Gilroy challenges the historical tenets of absolutism, nationalism, essentialism, and an origin geography with that of hybridity, movement, impurity, and amalgamation. So Gilroy positions the Black Atlantic as a space of transnational cultural construction where histories are mutually constituted and invariably entangled. And so I want to highlight two works in Jamal's show. You see it here, I want to talk about this one. It's called Peace of the Sargasso Sea. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit here. So in very brief, Jamal is looking at the Sargasso Sea as what he sees as sort of the primary place of where this cultural hybridity, the site of the Middle Passage. And so the Sargasso Sea essentially is an unbounded sort of body of water between Africa, Europe, and North America. 
And the Sargasso Sea kind of lives in actual geography, but it lives in sort of literature and mythology as well. As well, This sort of place where these circular currents bring together marine life. It's known as one of the sort of largest garbage islands in the world, and yet it also has crystalline waters. And so it's this place of sort of continual contradiction and sort of fascination. But it was also the site of the Middle Passage, and this is where slaves from Africa were being taken and transported to both North America and Europe. An incredibly horrific and painful and life-threatening time. This was a time when slaves were being purposefully broken up, their tribes were being broken up, and so there were numerous sort of populations and communities in transit, and they were landing at multiple locations around sort of this, this part of the world. And Jamal and Paul Gilroy sort of argue that a great deal of cultural exchange happened in those, those passage, in that passage, and in that translation, and in that travel, that continues to sort of evolve and, and sort of resonate today. And so with this body of work, the piece of the Sargasso Sea, essentially Jamal creates an abstracted rendition of that. That triangle is meant to represent points in Africa, North America, and Europe. And all of the sort of patterning speaks to the frequency of travel that was taking place between the 16th and 19th century. And you see this block of material sort of at the, ba at the bottom of this bass drum, or hi-hat. And it's, it's a block of sargassum. And sargassum is the seaweed that comes out of the Sargasso Sea. And as it, it lands everywhere along the coast, including Galveston, Texas, and sort of multiple locations around this base area. And as it dries, it goes from green to a purplish, reddish, to a kind of blackish brown that very much resembles African-American hair. And so Jamal positions this, sort of this block, this triangle, where this consciousness grows out of it, and a consciousness that is especially expressed through music. Jamal is not a musician himself, but he sees music as the sort of depository where a great deal of culture has been born and circulated and exchanged and negotiated. And so you see from this sort of hair, from this consciousness, grows this drum, and then on the top is a piece of brain coral that he's located. And as we lit it, you can see that the light kind of hits the top of that symbol and kind of illuminates the entire, so it looks like, even though it's a static sculpture, there's this play of light that almost gives it an animate quality. And I really feel like this is one of the sort of central pieces in the show. And I just want to highlight how it influences another major work by Jamal, which is called Lights from the Garden. Jamal is a practicing Muslim, but he doesn't sort of forefront it. He, he, in a lot of ways, he speaks more to the syncretic qualities of religion. And what I mean by that is, Lights from the Garden essentially takes the shape of sort of the, a, a mosque and sort of where the sermon is delivered from that mosque, but it is built from chairs that Jamal has sampled from the Audubon Ballroom where Malcolm X was assassinated. And all of the rods that you see sort of piercing those chairs speak to the 14 times that Malcolm X was shot. And so they're, they're both trajectory rods, as well as if we speak to art history, the way that light is sort of materialized through the auras and the halos that you've seen with those sort of extending rods. It's this idea that Malcolm X was arguably assassinated by members of the Nation of Islam, that he was sort of having a conflict with Elijah Muhammad, and so there's this suggestion of betrayal from sort of the, the, the body with which he sort of ascended. And Lights from the Garden refers to the way that Jesus Christ was sort of betrayed by Judas and the lights in the Garden of Gethsemane essentially identified Christ. And so Jamal, you can see, is bringing together sort of multiple threads and really speaking to, he's creating both memorials um, to sort of fallen figures within the Black Power Movement as well as sort of in guess, investigating where that voice lays in the contemporary moment. So that's kind of the, what I wanted to highlight within Jamal's show. So there is a lot more, but th these are sort of two particular installations. And what I was really fascinated as we continue the show is what, what John is doing at the Houston Museum of African American Culture. I have to say the first time I met John, we went over there and he's like, we are a fixture within our community. We speak to the African American population 
And yet John has expanded that to really speak to multiple cultures and the way that those cultures intermingle and exchange. And so I was hoping, John, if I could just bring you in at this point to kind of speak to. Sure, but I, I wanted to say a little bit about uh, the Middle Passage because yeah, the Middle agree, Passage yeah. right now is being uh, considered by a number of artists. Uh, if you look at David McGee, for instance, uh, this passage and uh, the full the full exploration of what that meant in terms of cultures coming together. That now you're not talking about an experience that was one horrific sort of like siloed experience, but rather one where cultures came together. And he's got, he's sort of taken a, and reimagined, he's got, um, uh, he's reimagined in, in abstraction uh, how these cultures came about and what was going on with those Africans there. Uh, on those ships, and so there are voices that come out of the middle passes by McGee, for instance, that suggest that we could take over this ship, and that in those boats during that passage were the roots of, in fact, rebellions that took place throughout the, the Caribbean and the New World. Uh, and then if you look at Betty Saar, uh, who had an exhibit up actually at ICA Miami, uh, and Betty Saar, there's a really wonderful piece that she calls Bride of Bondage, and Bride of Bondage is this, um, you, you look up and there's this big uh, life-size wedding dress. And behind it on the floor, you see these slave ships, these ships that are coming from Africa, part of the Middle Passage. And she talks about the fact that this bondage, these Bride of Bondage, this bride is really, what's the most prevalent sight that you see? It's this wedding, this wedding gown. And underneath it are all of these people that have come together. So in a sense, she talks about bride of bondage as the bondage that Africans now have, but it was also a cultural experience that we are all bound together now through <coughs> this, this trade, this middle passage. Mm -hmm. uh, so I did want to say that you know what Jamal is doing is something that is a full kind of reinterpretation of the middle passage that's going on now by a number of artists, and especially artists of color, sort of claiming the middle passage is something that's different, that is a, a more multicultural experience, and defining it as a multicultural experience than as, than as it's been interpreted before. That probably speaks to the whole idea of pluralism. And one aspect of pluralism that is important is that where are the voices coming from? Um, how are these voices in conversation together? At uh, the Houston Museum of African American Culture, of course, our mission is uh, to have a, it's not American history through an African, Amer an African American lens. It is more a multicultural conversation on race geared towards a common future. And that was an assistance that I had in taking over that post. Because actually, if we really want to get down to what really happened, what really happened were a number of combined voices. We're just now at a point where we can sort of separate those out and look at those voices. And in the absence of a black asset, you're not able to really hear the voice that, that comes from the authenticity of that experience, that lived experience. By way of example, as a metaphor, if you live with a partner, you're in an existence that is not defined just by one partner's memory of it. <laughs> Unfortunately, at times, it is defined by the memory of both partners. And in this instance, pluralism for us means that we get a fuller, larger picture. One last example at the museum we had, um, when we considered the civil rights movement, um, we had uh, a number of people, but we, had a, we invited someone to give a talk uh, named Marvin Nathan, and everyone said, well, what do you have this white guy coming to give this talk? And I said, well, first of all, he's Jewish. But outside of that, uh, if you looked at the film Mississippi Burning, you would see in there these FBI agents who go into these southern towns who are trying to get uh, black Americans to talk, to give them a reason to bring their local police, their local authorities to some kind of justice and to make change in, the, in their lives. Well, Marvin Nathan graduated from the University of Texas and then he went to work for the Department of Justice Civil Rights and Marvin Nathan was one of those people. 
I mean, he was in Louisiana, and he tells this story about how did he make a breakthrough. He was in Louisiana, a small town, uh, and, and it's, it's very appropriate that we're at the University of Houston, because at that time, the University of Houston had, um, had uh, enrolled, for the first time, these black basketball players, black football players, too. But one of them was named Elvin Hayes, the other one, Don Chaney. When Marvin Nathan was in Louisiana, he was just at wit's end. He just couldn't get anybody to talk. And, um, and as he was leaving, he sort of muttered under his breath in frustration, well, I guess I'll just have to go back to the University of Houston. And, uh, and there was a black guy there who said to him, you know the University of Houston? And Marvin said, yes, I do. And he said, do you know Elvin Hayes? And uh, Marvin said, well, I was smart enough to say I do. And the guy said, he's from here. And that opened the door of a conversation that led to, in fact, some significant things that happened in Louisiana. And I say that all to say that if we just didn't, if we omitted that part of the story, we wouldn't have the full story. It's a big argument for pluralism. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Great, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use this occasion now to open up a question and, and ask both Michael and John, and I, I think I'll chime in a little. Um, so I'm originally from Toronto, and I've been in Houston now for three years. One of the most striking and galvanizing similarities is the multiculturalism of both cities and the civic pride taken in recognizing and promoting this demographic diversity. That said, we know that race and ethnicity remain a highly sensitive, politically charged, and often contested terrain. What is the museum's role in this larger societal negotiation? Well, we both do that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Um, I think, well, the, one of the reasons that we wanted to, to partner specifically with um, Houston Museum of African American Culture was because of this shared ethos that museums can affect, can reflect the uh, pluralism, the, the, the diversity of each of these communities locally, um, and also project the importance of that to the broader world in thinking about these issues. And so it was a, a, a cross-border uh, collaboration on that front, but I think it was very specifically, um, it was very specific to, to, that we wanted to bring Kumbi Saleh to, to your institution, John. Yeah. That was really incredibly important because of that shared value. The role for, from, where, from our position at the Agra Khan Museum, the role uh, of museums in discussing these issues, these issues is to sort of open up that conversation, to really spotlight questions of pluralism, to have people think about these questions in new ways uh, through art, to open up the, the dialogue, and actually to, uh, to maybe not um, directly address anything that's too, uh, that's in, in too bold a way, so as to sort of, um, alienate certain people, but to welcome everyone in at the same time. And, and as we do that, we can um, perhaps have that, begin to open up that conversation. It's by, I think, staging a piece like Kumbi Saleh in a gallery that is very historic, where we begin to upend narratives of what actually constitutes the Islam, what is African, what are, um, what are our sh shared values across time and space. I mean, it opens up all of these questions. And um, I think that to have a dedicated space in Toronto where we focus on issues like that is incredibly important and is really a celebration and a testament to um, the incredible richness and diversity of Toronto as a community. Um, I'm, I'm very sure. much the same. Well, that's right. And you know, we, uh, I mean, the beauty of having a trusted place where you say that, and your mission is to have a multicultural conversation means that every voice is included and has some, some validity in terms of the conversation. Um, Houston, for instance, Houston is statistically, demographically, the most diverse city in the country, we say. But in terms of race, it is also the fourth most economically segregated city in the country. And so it's hard to talk about diversity, statistical demographic diversity, without talking about the segregation that exists here. The Smithsonian did an article on Houston that talked about the diversity and said, yeah, but if you go up in a helicopter and you look down, 
It's really sliced pies. Uh, and, and so if you know that, then you have to find a place to say, let's talk about these things because everybody's got a voice and let's talk about them. And that means that we then deal with some harder conversations, more difficult conversations. We did, um, we did a, a community meeting based with uh, academicians as a controlled factor. We did one on uh, why did 53% of white women vote for Donald Trump? Uh, and the beauty of it was that we had white women in that audience. And that so empowered the conversation and understanding of people who were there in attendance that uh, we knew that we were on to something and that we had to become that trusted space. We will have exhibitions up that um, that kind of, if you're multicultural, rankle a, a little bit of everybody. We've been told, for instance, uh, why uh, all of the Africa stuff? And I would say, well, because in front of America is African, it's African American. Uh, that's uh, an identity that uh, we want to share and explore. Uh, now we're, we're in a place where we can explore, you know, Islam in a, in a, in a, and with an exhibition that allows us to say, how come we haven't talked about it more? Uh, it's all over the world. Uh, there's Apple and there's what's the, there's the, rather the iPhone and there's Android. They're actually going on at the same time. Uh, but there's a broadness of it that if we understand all of it, we have a better understanding of the whole. Uh, and so we've been, you know, we've had, the other thing that we try to do is, in terms of diversity, we try to be, the museum that we expect other people to be in. Where the Aga Khan Museum in Toronto has this great African collection there, we try to show at HMAC uh, not just African American artists. And so we have had uh, any kind of artist that you can talk about. And probably the goal of this, and the, well, it was based on a couple of things, but the first one was that we did not want anybody coming into that museum, any young, if they were African American or Latinx, we did not want them to come into that museum and think that, and reinforce a sense of segregation. That there was a special place. We wanted to, we were multicultural, we wanted to be part of the world and you get to see and like whatever you like. And that, and probably the, the biggest compliment that uh, we got from that feedback was when there was, well, two, one I didn't like, but the other one, the, the more positive one was when this little black kid, we had this uh, Latinx exhibition upstairs, and, uh, and we had this really good exhibition downstairs by this African American, and uh, this African American kid said, now the really good stuff is upstairs uh, with, uh, I don't know, it's Benito Wawoka or whatever, but, uh, and there you had that choice that choice where people weren't suggesting that they had to be in a certain place. They just spoke to, they just responded to the humanity that was presented to them through the art. Uh, the other one was, of course, we did an artist uh, where <laughs> all of the kids would run upstairs for this guy's work <laughs> and I had curated a show downstairs that I thought was pretty intense and educational. But kids would come in and their parents, the word got out and their parents would go upstairs. We did one show and I'll stop, but we did one show called My Life as a Doll. And this was a show where it was an installation by a woman, Tara Conley. Uh, and um, it was an installation of a dollhouse and how women were treated uh, through that house. Uh, My Life as a Doll, that they were props at different times in different rooms. And I remember getting this irate call from uh, this uh, black woman who said to me, I cannot believe that the African American Museum in Houston would start its season with an exhibition by a white woman. And I responded by saying, we didn't. We started the season with an, with an exhibition about girls and women. And, uh, and the most ironic thing about that exhibition was we thought that it would attract just women, mothers, and their daughters. 
but we had more men bringing their sons to that exhibition than not. So I think the, I guess the point is that pluralism opens up doors and allows us to see things and learn more from each other than it does when we're in silos. I, I don't, before we move on, I, I want to actually turn it to you because I, I think that you're operating, Absolutely. Stephen, in a completely different space in an academic context. And just thinking about what John was saying just now and thinking about Kumbi Saleh at the Aga Khan Museum, um, how, uh, how exhibitions of the types that we're talking about and how works that were, the, the types that we're talking about disrupt the space and kind of jar people to think in new ways about what a museum can be and the kinds of stories that a museum can tell. So you're speaking to a very different set of audiences uh, at the Blapper. So um, just to turn it to you, how do you see the work that the Blapper is doing uh, in this respect and in, in engaging the particular uh, demographic at uh, University of Houston? Yeah. I, I think like the, the both the opportunity and challenge that we have at the Blaffer is that we are an intersection point. Um, the University of Houston is sort of seen as a gateway between the campus community, campus life, and the larger city. And so we want to reflect the campus, you know, both of those populations. And I think we do it the best way by, you know, I saw this as an opportunity when it came to Houston is that this campus alone has 47,000 students. It's one of the most diverse in the country. And I really strove that I wanted this, our program to reflect that diversity. And so our program, our exhibition schedule, has artists from across the spectrum. So we have African American and Latinx and Asian and Middle Eastern. And it's not that I'm just trying to check off all the boxes. I really, I see the opportunity of the Black and where we're situated is that we need to be reflecting all of those cultures, all of the conversations between them in a very ongoing basis. We are not positioning ourselves as authorities or experts. I have to be very mindful of that. Um, but we just, we try to be the liaison or the conduit between what artists are saying and the voices, how they can speak to students um, and how they can speak to the larger city. And so we just want to continually sort of operate in that flux zone never assuming that position of expertise or authority, but really kind of creating more of a flattened democratic space where we could just keep having these conversations between the artists and the exhibitions as well as the audiences that sort of come to interact with you know, these programs. I think that's one of the interesting things about this, the recent efforts in museums to be more uh, inclusive, to be more multivocal, is that it actually goes in two directions. So you have this sort of reassessment, the decolonization of the museum, which is not just about objects and artifacts and their histories, but about a mentality, mm -hmm. about shifting yeah, mentalities absolutely. within a museum and starting new ways of thinking um, about what, how museums um, tell stories, including by not taking an authoritative voice on, on different areas. But it's also about providing opportunities and, and creating spaces where shows that do reflect the people who you want to come in and who do come in and see themselves. So it actually is this sort of two-way street. You're sort of, there's this idea of, for lack of a better word, overhauling how we think about museums internally, and then at the same time, bringing more people in so they can see themselves in that space. Um, so I think, I, think, I think there's a really good point that Stephen made as well about not trying to be the authority, uh, but the artists actually just give voices that the community responds to. I mean, we are, you know, just having multiple, just reflecting like everyone else, everybody into that museum um, allows for these conversations to occur that we don't control, but we benefit from. I want to, you know, there's, I, I totally agree with you. There's, I think there, the museums have sort of been put into a place of great humility now where we are sort of like, we circulate now amongst the people, but this also creates a space, especially in social media, where museums are regularly called out. Like I remember that moment around George Floyd and, and museums were, what is your statement going to be on representing African American identity? And there, there was, there was, they got very intense and very heated and museums were being called to the mat, of, like you are not doing enough. And I don't think we, you know, historically museums have been unassailable, whereas now, We've entered into that discourse, and now we are sort of held accountable. 
how do we how do we negotiate that place where you are now answering in a very direct way to the public? And we know that the public is never unified in its sentiment. It comes in a lot of different directions. So. Wants to feel it's, I, well, <laughs> it's, an, it's an interesting question because there is that voice where we are held, we, and to a certain extent, we've always been held accountable to our constituents, mm -hmm. always. But um, there is this increased attention to how we respond, how we speak for, for communities, for the communities that we live in mm -hmm. and work in. Um, and the communities that we represent. So if, if you are a culturally specific institution, um, you have a sort of responsibility, you, you've taken on the mantle of responsibility for speaking um, to issues that are that come up that are immediately relevant. At the same time, we're still balancing against these traditional other, um, we have other responsibilities that we also have to balance that against. And um, well, you know, and it's yeah. and, and it's also interesting that if you're looking at this from a black asset, um, this whole period has been one where there's been more uh, more pressure to, in fact, only give the exhibitions that reflect a black experience and a contemporary black experience. I know we did. Uh, it was quite interesting. We did. Um, we talked about this. We did. Um, uh, we did a, a, a workshop at the American Alliance of Museums, and it was on uh, diversity. And when we did the exhibition, I mean the the workshop, uh, we started talking about diversity, and we pick up. We started showing. Uh, white faces and brown faces and yellow faces and uh, we got some pushback uh, especially from some museums that said we thought you were going to talk about diversity and I said we are talking about diversity it's from our point of view and uh, and I think that during this period it's been where there's been a real pressure to bring black voices into academies of dominance, there's also been pressure on black assets to, at least at HMAC, to ensure that we also bring some universality and put that in a perspective that people can relate to uh, during this period. And we've had a lot of pressure about that. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really interesting point that pluralism is often seen from a very particular subject perspective and it's not necessarily seen from it's about making spaces for other another and that is not what we're sort of upending our own efforts and if we take that perspective you know that really the multivocality comes from who's telling the story who's asking the questions and whose pluralism is it so, so to speak I think this is also these what you just brought up Stephen which is a challenge dealing with audiences in these new ways, being held accountable in new ways, actually only makes us, has made us stronger. Mm -hmm. It's sharpened how we tell stories. It's sharpened, I think, many people's view about why they got into museums in the first place and thrown it into relief and um, has allowed us to create really new and exciting um, presentations of art in ways that we hadn't thought about before because we do have to think even more broadly about what our responsibilities are in, in our communities and in society. And it says something, Stephen, that, I mean, that even that the University of Houston brought Stephen here as a director, because part of Stephen's reputation is that he was community-minded. Mm -hmm. uh, he stretched into the community, and that was a big asset for the Blaffer to have at the University of Houston to bring in a director who was in tune with the times uh, and the pressures of the, of the, of the contemporary time. Well, I know, thank you very much for this. It's fascinating. We're, we're coming up in an hour now, so I just want to ask just if our audience has any questions uh, before we kind of wrap up here. Well, I just had a comment. I, I just want to say how sad uh, I am that so many more people missed out on this incredible trio. You know, you've been amazing. And just highlighting exactly what you do every day and make it so easy for us to understand in so many ways what pluralism means. So thank you. <laughs> and I you know, just want to say thank you so much for the collaboration.
inspiration, and um, really, we, we're just honored to have all of you speak today. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And thanks to the audience, and thank you to audiences who are tuning in, because this is also live streamed, and so we have hopefully um, a lot of people tuning in who may not be able to have made it physically to this space, but are out there in uh, in cyberland, <laughs> whatever that happens well, to well, be. And, and we do because I've gotten some uh, some text from uh, places saying that we're looking at you right now. Oh, <laughs> but I, I would be remiss without saying that I want to thank the sponsors, our sponsors for Kumisala uh, 3020 C at the museum, uh, and I have to. Uh, absolutely thank our, our main sponsors, which are the uh, Houston Endowment, uh, HEB, and the uh, Board of Directors of the uh, Houston Museum of African American Culture. <laughs> I just have to, one more thing is that, you know, this resonates with all of us because, in fact, the four of us are actually born in Africa, we from Uganda, from Uganda, and uh, Tanzania. And you know, been to the Zanzibar with the slaves. You know, what what in and all this. When I see all this, and I'm saying, wow, you know, and, and you know, so we also live there, right. so we understand, you know, the black history, but how it's, you know, the whole, how we put it all together. And then we talk about West Africa and you know, all that. So it, to me, this was uh, amazing because you know, a lot of it I didn't know about, and I didn't know the artists. But I think thank you for. What do you call, uh, it is. Highlight. It, highlight. it is. Well, I'll tell you something. And our staff is small, but we have. They are delighted that uh, Aga Khan Museum sent this work to us because we have on staff a Nigerian and we have on staff a Liberian, uh, and they were like thrilled. In fact, uh, the Liberian, our chief curator, Chris Blay, uh took over the installation of this to be sure it was done just right, mm -hmm. even though it is on my watch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Are there other questions? And don't be shy. <laughs> I, I, I thought it was interesting that the word pluralism is not one that is used very much anymore. And um, I was appreciative. It's a word that I personally just hold very dear. Um, and instead, we talk a lot about diversity, and I was just Maybe they're synonymous, maybe they're not, and I'm curious to know what you think and why you chose the word pluralism. Like pluralism is addition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's also, I mean, from, from the perspective in, in Canada, there is um, a pluralism, diversity, but pluralism is, is, is used, I think, a lot more than in the States, but it is something that's very central to uh, the mission of the Aga Khan Museum. Um, it, it's part of the mission that was laid out by His Highness, our, our founder, the, His Highness the Aga Khan, um, and uh, is really thinking about, um, I think the, the way that we can sort of frame it in, in our minds right now is about, is about multivocality. It's about having more than one approach to, and more than one lens on a single issue. It's more than just having, um, it's more than just diversity, which I think, in my head, is you know, it's about bringing people together in an equal and, and measured manner. But pluralism, I think, adds this has a weight of being able to have multiple perspectives on single issues. That there isn't, and going back to this question of authoritativeness, right? Um, who gets to speak in the authoritative voice? And I think that it it is a term that, for me, dispels uh, that question of. Uh, it, it raises it and also dispels that notion, it, uh, giving sort of equal weight to all parties, so to speak. Yeah, it used to be a, a, a word that was used a lot in when we talked about democracy right. in, in right. body politics yes. in the United States, but I would say in the last 20 years, pluralism is not, not a word that you hear very much. Yeah. And so I was happy to see it and to hear what you all have to say. Yeah. Yeah. And just the way Michael talks about sort of decolonizing the institution, I like the idea of sort of chipping away at the absolutism, the essentialism, sort of the singularity of narrative, and talking much more about hybridity and evolution, how things are becoming much more fluid, rather than trying to protect sort of these singular, this has gotta be this. It's much more about how do we adapt and how do we best tell that story of what's happening around us 
you know, through the artworks and the programs that we're presenting at museums. And the opportunities that artists get with that. I mean, for instance, this whole discussion of the Middle Passage that all of a sudden artists can, of color, can actually interpret that and we have a different, fuller understanding of what the Middle Passage actually is. And it's really, right now, being explored. I, that it, I think that what, what you just both brought up is, um, I think, very, very critical to understanding. When we look at art and we look at institutions that are in these categories, when we look at academic institutions that create little departments that are for East Asian languages, Slavic, you know, whatever it happens to be, this is not lived experience. People live in the inter interstices. People live in the in-between so often. No one's absolutely this or that. And so when we think about, okay, we're gonna put on a show in a museum that's going to reflect XYZ community, it's not people's lived experience at all. Um, and history is, it's a very, it, it, when you think about how it is written, it is ideological. It's a choice that has been made to tell a certain kind of story. Whereas, in fact, we just heard comments of people who are uh, Muslim growing up in Africa, growing up in Tanzania, growing up in Uganda, uh, now living in, in Houston, Texas. What, this is a story that is much more than a story of Islamic culture or a story of African culture or a story of American culture. It's a, it's a much bigger picture than that. And I think we need to strive in museums to understand and to recognize that we can't put things in these kinds of categories. It's just not lived experience. It doesn't reflect how any of us live anymore. Well, really. I think that you're right, and you know, we could go on and on with this, yeah. but, but I think that you're right when you bring up lived experience, because if you look at the world today, and you have a family reunion, then diversity actually is very prevalent. I mean, in every family, go to a family reunion that's wide enough, you're gonna see all kinds of people there of different races, and there's a diversity there. And if we don't reflect that, we're not really reflecting contemporary lived realities. I think that's an excellent punctuation. That's an excellent, excellent. Uh, so thank you. <laughs> Do you remember me? Yeah,